right. And you can hear me all right? Yep. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, how many of you are familiar with antifragility? Four or five hands. Wow. Okay. Okay. For the rest, I'm going to fix that in the next 30 minutes, I hope. A uh, little bit about myself. I am a trainer, consultant, coach, uh, researcher in uh, the uh, areas mentioned here. And I'm also involved in a, uh, in a couple of um, research initiatives. Maybe interested to, uh, to mention uh, the middle one. Uh, if you en uh, introduce Agile or DevOps in an organization, you will have a lot of discussions with control with procurement, with HR, with uh, compliance. Who is familiar with that? A lot of discussions. Yeah, right. Um, and we are trying to bring those worlds uh, closer together. Before we start talking about fragility, I would like to talk about risks and risks management. This is from a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers, and they uh, actually explain how to deal with unknown risks. These are all strategies of how to deal with unknown risks. If you read these strategies, and PricewaterhouseCoopers is quite a smart company, if you read these strategies, they are all about known risks. Risks that you can come up with. Um, actually, you could say what you read there is a sort of risk theater, because it is not about the real risks, the unknown risks, the risks you should be aware of. Um, and I didn't coin that term myself, this creator, that was done by this man, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, and he says it's better to become less fragile to risks. So to make your system stronger, to make your organization stronger. He wrote this book, Anti-Fragile, and he actually says, um, well, how to uh, make sure that you benefit from chaos, that you benefit from risks that you make your organization and your systems stronger. So he's actually th uh, talking about things that gain from disorder. Um, what is anti-fragile? Uh, until 2012, we had only two words for something that was not fragile, and that was uh, robust and resilient. And from 2012 onwards, we had the third word, anti-fragile. What's the difference? Um, so something anti-fragile actually deteriorates from the very beginning. And if it, there is an unexpected event, it collapses. If something is robust, it will uh, remain steady for a long time until it hits an unexpected event and it will collapse. If you have something resilient, it will have a dip, but it will get back to the original level. But it will not get better than it was. And anti-fragile actually will have a little dip, but then learn from the unexpected event, learn from the risk, and get stronger after that. Let me give you some examples. Some examples from, uh, from your daily, uh, daily life. This is something fragile. We can all understand that, of course. Um, an example from IT. Agile, agile sec is actually fragile. And why is that? Because we have this finished work at the end, which is actually a potentially shippable increment, which actually means that the risks are building up. Because Agile without DevOps, Agile without continuous delivery, what we are making at the end, the finished work, is not put to the test. So it's actually building up risk. So Agile alone is actually fragile. Let me give you a robust example. This uh, car from the uh, American uh, uh, president, well, you could call that something which is robust. Um, in IT terms, we could think of this little beast, the Linux beast. It's also very robust. It needs a very unexpected heavy event to, uh, to break down. Who, is, who does recognize this beast? Anybody? Phoenix, Phoenix right. Phoenix. That's actually a resilient animal because it rises from its own ashes, but it will never get better than it was. It will get back to the level it was actually born with. And when I uh, introduce an IT example, actually this cockpit from an Airbus 380 is actually a flying IT system. It is resilient. If a hydraulic system fails, there is an, another hydraulic system. If both hydraulic systems fail, there is an electrical system. Or there is a vacuum system. There's a lot of systems. It keeps flying. Um, 
when I talk about anti-fragile, who is familiar with this, this beast? Hydra, right. And what is one of the main features of Hydra? If you cut off one head of Hydra, it immediately grows back two heads. So with every attack, it becomes stronger. So you could actually say it from Greek mythology. It was uh, actually anti-fragile avant la letter, be before the word even exists. And when we look at IT, uh, you may be familiar with the chaos. Who is familiar with the chaos monkey? Oh, a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Um, so the chaos monkey, you may, uh, for the people who don't know that, uh, it's actually, it introduces failures, outages between 9 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock, 3 uh, a.m., uh, 3 p.m., I must say, in the afternoon. Uh, and the intent incentive for the engineers is that um, they will, uh, yeah, they will make sure that the system responds well, and if it doesn't, they can do it, uh, they can fix it during office hours, or, or office hours. So the incentives is that they will not be paged in the weekend or in evenings or at night. And later on, they introduced some other monkeys, even the Chaos Gorilla, because they became immune to the Chaos Monkey. So that is actually proof that it works. The Chaos Gorilla introduces more failures at the same time and heavier failures. And all the, together they put it into a Simeon army, uh, and that is something that you can download right now in the GitHub. Okay. Um, some extra information about anti-fragility. Anti-fragility also comes in layers. We already learned that a Airbus 380, an aircraft, is resilient, but the whole aircraft industry, the aviation industry, is actually anti-fragile because it learns from every mistake. Like the Boeing 737 MAX, uh, there were some accidents with uh, the 737 MAX, and all 737 MAXs all over the world were grounded until they learned what the problem actually was. So the aviation industry, the layer above the aircraft, is actually anti-fragile. So you could say, if we look at a iceberg, if we look at anti-fragility, you could say that uh, yeah, chaos engineering is absolutely one of the yeah, most uh, common uh, examples of anti-fragility. But it is only the tip of the iceberg. Are you, it is Monday morning, it is 9.15, are you already ready for some heavy math? Yeah, oh, I, I see people nodding, okay, okay. Uh, well, it's not that complex. Actually, what we see in the book of, uh, of uh, Taleb, he introduces variables, and they can increase and they can decrease, and they will generate pain or they will generate gain. And we are not talking about something linear, I mean, for instance, this could be your salary, for instance. Uh, so the higher, the better, and below a certain amount, uh, it will be really painful, for instance. Or this could be the number of incidents, uh, the lower, the better. But this is not what it is about, because anti-fragility is actually about um, non-linearity. So not the linear stuff, but the non-linear stuff. And this is actually what the definition of, um, of uh, anti-fragility is. Um, fragile systems uh, accelerate uh, towards pain, and anti-fragile systems accelerate towards gain. So, let me give you an example. Um, if you decrease this variable, then it will only generate a little bit of gain. But if you increase this variable, it rushes towards pain. Other way around. Uh, if you um, increase this variable a little bit, it will only generate a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of pain. And when you decrease a variable, it will generate a lot of gain. So what would this be? Would this something be so something fragile or anti-fragile? Anybody? <laughs> it is fragile, yeah, right. Whatever you do, if you increase the variable or you decrease the variable, in both cases, it rushes towards harm. It rushes towards pain. And um, so, and the other one, the right one, the convex one. So the concave one is actually uh, fragile, and the convex one is actually 
uh, anti-fragile. And with the anti-fragile one, it doesn't matter what I do, whether I increase the variable or, or I decrease the variable, in both cases, it rushes towards uh, gain. So another aspect is that I have to know less about the variable when I am anti-fragile, because it doesn't matter. In all cases, what I, whatever I do, what I do in experiments, it all rushes towards gain. Um, and to um, and uh, there's another there's another point um, because you see the blue dot and here you see the yellow dot. I don't know in most cases where I am when I am experimenting with a variable. I don't know where I am. In an anti-fragile environment, it actually doesn't matter because it always uh, uh, moves towards the positive side. To memorize this, just this last slide, um, the right one, of course, the smile is the anti-fragile one and the frown is the uh, fragile one. Um, let me give you an IT example. Suppose that the variable is the number of deployments per month. And suppose I don't deploy at all because I have a 20-year-old back-office system and I never have to deploy anything. I will be happy. But as soon as I need to make some changes in that 20-year-old back-off system, I become less happy over time until I keep increasing the number of deployments per month, and in the end, I will see that I will be happy again. So you could say, because of that, that continuous de deployment is actually something anti-fragile. And after that, it doesn't matter. Whether I decrease the number of deployments or I increase the de number of deployments, doesn't matter. Another example, IT example. Suppose I have the number of tasks I coordinate in a software project. Suppose I don't coordinate anything at all. Then it will be chaos, that will be pain. As soon as I start coordinating, I will get happier. But, as you all know, software projects always grow too large, and when they are too large, they get out of hand and there will be chaos again. So, you could say software projects are fragile, and they are. We will get, come back to that later. Um, I already shared the first uh, aspect of asymmetry with you, that was the non-linearity. The second one is optionality. When you read this, an option uh, is a contract which gives the buyer the right, but not the obligation to do something. I think in most that most of you now think of something financial, right? But it could also be something else, because the financial ones, they are in most cases visible, but also expensive. And the other ones, the non-financial options, are actually, uh, for instance, uh, things like starting a company. Like uh, this overview of the Unicorn Club, uh, the number of uh, the, the organizations that became worth more than $1 billion in the stock market. And it becomes busier and busier uh, the more you get to the right part of this uh, graph. And what we also see is that the uh, time to unicorn valuation is always also getting shorter. So for instance, uh, the one on the left that is Magic Leap, which only took seven months to become worth more than $1 billion. Who's familiar with Magic Leap? Who's yeah, okay, I see only one hand, yeah. Magic Leap, I will show you a video, and that video is still not, it's, it's actually how they promoted themselves in the beginning, but still they are not able to do what is in this video, but they are still experimenting, they are still trying options to reach that. I will show the video, it's a short video. <laughs> So that's how they promote themselves, but right now uh, Magic Leap is still using uh, glasses, still using goggles. And at the same time, if you look at their, uh, on their website, you z see very strange uh, vacancies like uh, a light field architects, because they are trying to switch from analog light to digital light and no one has been able to f fix it actually. And they also, they did, did manage that, but they are still experimenting. And experimenting is important, you know that, because 
that was already in the Phoenix product. Do, how many of you read the Phoenix product? Ah, uh, many hands, I love that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and the third way is, as you know, is about experimenting. It's very important to experiment. And the good point is that if you are anti-fragile, experimenting is perfect, because whatever experiment you do, it all, the, all the outliers will be positive. And of course, we have also fragile experimenting, and that's dangerous. Uh, but actually, the most, most organizations are still fragile, so experiments could be dangerous. And in this, that case, it is important to uh, reduce the negative outliers, to reduce actually the downside of experiments. And um, what, um, what Taleb introduces in his book is via negativa. Normally, we add a lot of measures, etc., to make some things work, and what he is actually saying is, um, you should actually uh, subtract, remove, uh, eliminate, uh, delete to make sh to make sure that there is uh, there is less of the things you are trying to do. Um, and one of the best examples is actually technical debt. You got you have to get rid of technical debt. And this is my fav favorite definition from uh, Gene Kim from uh, from technical debt. It's it's actually what you feel the next time you want to make a change. Well, that's the most perfect definition of technical debt, uh, what, uh, what, what's me concerned. Um, I would, to, uh, to get rid of technical debt, I would like to introduce you, uh, to you the four-color backlog. The four-color backlog, uh, it actually says that your work consists of four colors. Blue is something that your customer wants. It's actually the features. Yellow is the, the defects, so resolving the defects. Red is reducing technical debt. And green is improving your own process. If you ask your customer what he wants, what two colors will he pick? What? Sorry? Yeah, he will, he will, um, uh, he will pick the blue and yellow colors. Absolutely. But if you uh, would do that, if you would only work on blue and yellow, then you will, if this, these are sprints, for instance, if these are six sprints, you will drown in defects, uh, let's say, in the fourth or fifth uh, sprints. So you have to introduce also <laughs> the red and the green. And when you also work on red and green, um, preferably every week, maybe every day. Every day should uh, contain four colors of work, or maybe every week should contain four colors of work. Um, and then you will be able to manage down the uh, yellow work, and there will be room again for the blue, uh, blue work. But of course, you have to uh, bite the bullet, uh, because yeah, it could be hard to uh, to um, make your customer also want those four colors. Uh, it also depends on the product owner, what the product owner wants. Um, it, is, it is perfectly all right to have a variation in the color composition. So what you would see here, this is actually from a uh, different example. This is from the book uh, Product to Product. Um, and where uh, we say actually the, the green uh, color is actually the features. So we uh, shipped a lot of features in the first five months of 2018, and we hardly had any time to work on blue, which is depth, and orange, which is, which is actually a risk. So this is a little bit different, but the, the aspects are actually the same. Um, and then we say, okay, in June 2018, we cut down features to the half because we have to work on reducing depth and to work on risks again. Um, and one of the best ways to, uh, to do that is uh, to work, for instance, with a Kanban uh, and then a Kanban in different layers. So maybe a row for every color so that you have a, a, a very, very visual insight of how much work you actually put in every color. So that's actually the second uh, aspect of asymmetry. I also have the third aspect, and that is about transferring uh, fragility. It says the definition from the book is if one party has the downside and another party has the upside, fragility is being transferred from one party to the other. This 
sounds a little bit theoretical, but this is what happens a lot in, uh, in IT. And the other way around is what we call skin in the game. This concept is very old. It actually, it already uh, existed more than 3,700 years ago um, in Mesopotamia, and uh, King Hammurabi, actually, they, he had 282 laws carved in stone, and especially uh, law 229 was very important, and we can translate it to uh, nowadays IT, because it says if a builder builds a house and the house collapses and causes the death of the owner of the house, the builder shall be put to death. Whoa. Now, that is a skin in the game, because they had a, a problem with uh, unstable houses in those days, so the builder had to build a stable, solid house, or otherwise he would be put to death if it would collapse. So that is actually, uh, you could say, okay, if I translate it to IT in 2023, um, what, are we, what could we think of? Well, we could think of, for instance, silos. In silos, skin in the game is missing. So if we have dev in one silo and ops in another silo, they don't have um, uh, skin in each other's game. So you want, actually, you would like a DevOps team which has skin in each other's game. So you could say silos in an the organization, they are actually fragilizers. Um, another one uh, where skin in the game is missing is actually when you talk about projects. Projects take into account the benefits and the initial, initial uh, uh, costs, but they don't think that much about operational cost. They don't have skin in the ops game. If the project is over, they let it go. So you could also say that projects, and we learned that in the very beginning, software projects are fragile, but projects themselves are also fragilizers in your organization. And the last one is where skin in the game is missing, is with command and control management. Um, who's familiar with this book, Turn the Ship Around? Ah, again, three hands, yeah. Turn the Ship Around um, from David Marquet. He actually says that um, if you uh, work with, uh, with, with command, command and control uh, management, uh, what you see in an organization that is information is going up and decisions are going down. And that's a very slow procedure. Actually, what you want to do is you want to push authority to the information level. So push authority down to the information level, the level where the information already is. That's a lot faster than information pushing that up and decisions push, pushing uh, down. And of course, uh, you have to make sure that people who um, uh, take that decentralized decisions, uh, they, have, uh, they should have, of course, be technically uh, competent, and they ha should have organizational clarity, and they should understand priorities. But in most cases, you could decentralize a lot of decisions to a lower level. So you could also say that command and control is also something fragilizing. If I put all these examples together, that's actually, I cannot show you only one picture which actually says it all, and that's this one. Are we or are we not in the same team? That's all what it is actually all about. So if I uh, attach that to the iceberg, we could say, okay, we have chaos engineering, we have reducing technical debt, we have continuous deployment, and we have de decentralized uh, decision making. Um, when we talk about anti-fragility, you could, um, and we talk about chaos engineering, and, uh, and et cetera, we could talk about inoculation, which actually means that uh, it's a little bit fragile because a vaccine is also a little attack in the system, and then the system becomes stronger, uh, the baby becomes stronger after that. So, the, and there is actually a biological version of antifragility, and that's hormesis. So the biological version of it is actually also a small dose is healthy, uh, a large dose is lethal. Um, if you translate that again to IT, we could talk about a canary release. Only a small dose of users in it and, um, well, that makes the system stronger if we fix any problems after, after that. Or, for instance, A-B testing. Also, small changes um, to make sure that the system uh, develops in the right direction. Or, for instance, uh, microservices. Um, 
uh, where you reduce the big decisions into smaller frequent decisions, and they are all upside. And if they are not upside, you rewrite the microservice to be make it become uh, upside. The previous slides actually reveal a very deep truth about software, and that is that software has this economies of scale. So milk comes in big cartons, and software is cheapest in lots of small cartons. That's always actually the fact. Um, another example is, uh, is auto-scaling, which is uh, more or less uh, an, an automated version of anti-fragility. So we could also put that on the, uh, on the iceberg. Um, I have another question for you. Um, what would be anti-fragile? Focusing on the mean time between failure or focusing on the uh, mean time to repair? What would you say? What is anti-fragile? Yeah, yeah. The mean time to repair is actually anti-fragile. Um, John Allspaw, uh, the man who uh, did his presentation 10 deploys a day in 2009, um, he says actually you should always focus on the MTTR. There are only two exceptions uh, where you should focus on the uh, mean time between failure, and that is in the case of space hardware, because if you launch something into space, it's very hard to maintain. So yeah, it should have a long uh, mean time between failure. Um, and the other one is, um, is when you have something embedded in your chest, you want also that it has a, a long mean time between failure. So uh, you could say, we could add that again and say, okay, we have it, microservices, we have A-B testing, auto scaling, focus on MTTR and canary release. They are all uh, contributing to, um, to uh, anti-fragility. We already mentions, mentioned via negativa. Um, and we already mentioned technical depth. There's also another form of uh, depth, and that is organizational depth. Um, who is familiar with the Spotify videos? The uh, Spotify engineering culture video. Yeah, I see uh, three, four hands. Yeah. Um, Spotify engineering culture video actually reveals things like uh, handoffs between teams, politics, fears, ego, um, a lot of organizational things that you want to get rid of, actually. Um, and what we could actually say that uh, organizational depth is, uh, is about uh, the hierarchy of an organization, which the does not match the operational model. So the organizational model of most organizations does not match the operational model because the upper one actually introduces silos vertically and after that we try to push some value horizontally through the organization. So that's actually, that doesn't work together. And in that case we are actually, we are talking about uh, Conway, Conway's law. Um, and Conway's law actually says that every system that you build is a copy of the communication structure of your organization. Always. And it is unbreakable. It will always be the case. But you can also turn it around. You can also leverage Conway's law and say, okay, uh, in this case, then I will make my organization smarter. I will make it, I will re reorganize my organization. Um, and in that case, I will be able to uh, build smarter systems. Um, what we actually, uh, in addition to Conway's law, trying to do is also uh, making an end, put an end to Taylor's, uh, Taylor's area. Uh, because he invented the four principles of scientific management in 1911. It is now 2023. And I think that some of these scientific uh, principles still uh, are part of your daily organization. Uh, if you read them, you think, well, it's not, we, are not, we did not get rid of it uh, in uh, 100%. Um, but these principles, they were designed for the assembly line, not for uh, producing software. If you are interested in this kind of uh, information, I would, uh, I would uh, recommend you to uh, 
read this book, Project to Product from, uh, from Mick Kirsten. And we don't have the time for this anymore, but uh, there is some uh, uh, quotes from the book on this particular uh, slide, um, which actually uh, should uh, uh, stimulate you to, uh, to read this book, because this book actually uh, states how your organization could work and that your current organization in most cases is actually making a digital transformation impossible. Um, I'm out of time, I was also almost out of slides, so we can say that uh, you put reducing organizational debt as a very, very big one on the bottom of the iceberg. So all these things actually uh, make sure that you reduce or uh, you work on your uh, anti-fragility. Um, that was my presentation just in time. I'm looking at the timer here. Uh, are there any questions? <coughs> do we have time for questions? We do, okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Samia. So my question is when, if I have to make my organization stronger from the bottom part of the iceberg, and I have to start somewhere, where should I start? Because everything looks nice and to be addressed, but let's agree we may not have that many resources and time. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you could I, you could uh, start with the low-hanging fruit. So whatever is low-hanging fruit for you, uh, that could be A/B testing, or that could be MTTR, or that could be uh, well, one of the other ones. Um, but the reason that is that uh, reducing organizational debt is so large on the bottom is that will help you uh, extremely. So if you would be able to. Uh, uh, also start working from the very beginning also on reduction of organizational debt, it will help you with all the rest above that. But in most cases that's, that's very difficult to do. We uh, run into Conway's law, uh, so just pick the low-hanging fruit, which is low-hanging fruit for you. Thank you. My question would be, um, all the what, what you mentioned in the presentation is what was basically written or discussed five years ago. So the question is how we are progressing on the journey in general as a, as a community, basically, of basically using this this knowledge to transform the companies. Uh, you mean you mean agility in general, or yes, yeah. Yes. Um, well, there are not men, none, there are not that many people uh, actually uh, working on the combination of anti-fragility and IT. Um, I know of uh, three, four other people who are actually doing that. But yeah, well, that's the reason that I'm uh, d d delivering these uh, these presentations about it. Um, I, see, I see. I see. Actually, oh, I think a lot of organizations are actually working on these things, but they don't realize that there is a uh, a common force behind it, below it. Um, and if, as soon as you start realizing that, it will it will um, um, it will reinforce each other. Actually, so um, yeah, it's actually the same. I would give the same answer that I uh, gave to the lady uh, who just uh, asked the previous question: is uh, just select your low-hanging fruit, and well, maybe also uh, read the book Anti-Fragile from uh, from Talib. Uh, it's very difficult to read, very difficult book, um, but it will give you a perspective of the, 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 yeah, the total environment you were actually working in. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Any other question? <laughs> yeah, go so ahead. Follow up to that question. Why? Why? Why are more organizations not utilizing anti-fragility concepts? Is it like a selling it to executives problem? Is it a nobody knows this enough? What? Um, why is that the case? Yeah, it, I think it, it's, it, it might be a little bit the same as, uh, as technical debt. Technical debt, I think, uh, I, I could ask that question. Who is working on reducing technical debt in his organization right now? Yeah, I would, I would say 10%. But reducing technical debt is also very, very, very important. And actually, we all know that know that or should know that but still it's very difficult and then we talk about management they say okay we want features we want to make sure that defects get uh, resolved and technical debt well we see that later and the same for product managers ah, technical debt we see that later yeah and it's so important and and organizational debt um it's 
also something you have to uh, deal with uh, with the management, of course. So um, actually, <laughs> what you're saying, I had one slide left, that was this one. Uh, from Peter Drucker. <laughs> it is actually also an answer to your question there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another question, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, just wanted to ask one question. Is there an adopted or accepted method of measuring fragility? And uh, could we use something like that to tell a story of why we should build systems who are anti-fragile? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I have been. Um, I'm, I'm doing research on on on, uh, on antifragility, and I put actually all the frequently asked questions uh, on this uh, on this site, antifragility.works. Can reach it via the QR codes. This is so. This is actually only publishing uh, publishing research. Um, but we don't have a way of measuring that yet. You could have say, of course, you could say technical debt is an important one. Uh, so, how much technical debt is there in your organization? But that's also difficult to measure. Uh, there are some uh, organizations, like, for instance, the Software Improvement Group, who measures uh, your software, and they could give a, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they, they could say something about the quality of your uh, of your software. But it's, yeah, it's not not that objective, in my opinion. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm afraid that we are running out of time. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. okay. But if you have a question, we still have breaks, right? Yeah, so I'm uh, available during the breaks. Yeah. And, I'd, uh, and then Christina is uh, waiting, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.